Having risen from nowhere, Wallace, the son of a minor noble, had led the Scots to an historic victory against the English at Stirling. He'd briefly held the highest office his country could bestow, but now, after Falkirk, he was out in the cold. Wallace was stripped of command of the army. Then the great Scottish lords signed a peace deal with King Edward, who was an aristocrat like themselves, in a different social class to Wallace, who kept on fighting, a move that inspired his transition into Hollywood legend, the man who would never bow down. I think that really is the answer to why William Wallace speaks to people today. The sense of what integrity truly is. We all are afraid to be apart from the crowd. And William Wallace was willing to go with his heart, to be true to that. But the real Wallace was a more complex man than the character portrayed in Braveheart. It would be easy to assume because Wallace continues the fight that, that Wallace is single-minded about Scottish independence and he will not uh, waver from that. But actually that's not exactly borne out by the evidence. Wallace wanted to come into Edward's peace, but Edward insists that Wallace alone must submit completely to his will. In, in other words, there's no guarantees that he will not be executed and Wallace cannot accept that. Uh, understandably. <laughs> so he continues the fight because he feels he has no choice. In 1305, Wallace, who seven years earlier had been guardian of the nation, was betrayed and captured by the Scottish nobility. On the 23rd of August, 1305, as the movie shows, he was tried before a panel of English judges in London, here at Westminster Hall. It must have been incredibly intimidating for Wallace. Because he was on trial for treason, he knew that this was him on the road to his execution. But coming here at the trial was at least an opportunity for him to object to the basic underlying premise of why he was there, which was to deny that Edward I had any right over the Kingdom of Scotland. Nonetheless, Edward saw things very differently. Edward fundamentally believed that he was the superior uh, authority over Scotland. He sort of thinks about Wallace and who is this man? How dare he defeat my armies in the field and pretend to assume the rights of King of Scots that I've abolished? It is a class thing. He's used to dealing with men he knows, men from the right class who have a personal loyalty to a king, not an abstract concept of loyalty to a nation, to a country. Wallace was found guilty. The same day, he was drawn through the streets of London to the gallows at Smithfields. Here, he would be hanged, then cut into quarters, a method of execution as sadistic as anything the darkest imaginations in Hollywood could conjure up. This is the spot on which William Wallace was executed. If you had committed the crime of treason by the later 13th century, you would expect to get something similar to Braveheart, if not worse. His grisly death is one aspect of Wallace's life the movie did get right. He was hanged for his early crime of robbery, then cut down and disemboweled. His internal organs were burned as punishment for sacking the abbeys of Northern England. For treason, Wallace's head was severed from his body and planted on a pole on London Bridge. Finally, as a ghastly threat to other would-be rebels, his body was cut into four sections. These were displayed in Perth, Newcastle, Berwick, and Stirling. It is a tragedy for Wallace, um, you know, to have ended up on this spot, the first martyr to the Scottish cause, and it's because of that, of course, that we still know his name today, because having come here and died that dreadful death, so many other people have taken him and created this great mythological figure, which ultimately found expression in Braveheart.